I, I've got very overwhelmed. I, I can't even remember them selling cheeses. Um, they had plain yogurts, which was really nothing to write home about in my mind. I think that I, you know, when I was introduced, I, the plain yogurt, why would you want to have plain yogurt? You'd want to have a fruit yogurt, wouldn't you? But they did do very, very delicious yogurt ice cream. Uh, and I do remember that. And, and, and they were very jolly. I, I remember Randolph um, serving the ice cream. I don't know whether I was aware that they were making it themselves or at that point interested in even asking that question, even asking, you know, the provenance of anything. It's, it's fairly well imprinted on my memory, so um, you would walk in, it was always damp, and um, there was a focal point in the far corner of the shop um, that you kind of gravitated to, which where the till was, and on either side of that focal point there was, a, there was two banks of cheese. Um, so it's not how the shop is now, because there's now in each shop you have one long counter, but then you had these two counters that were at right angles to one another. So you did kind of feel like the cheese was coming in on you, which I was, I liked that feeling. Um, and then behind you, there was the cheese uh, on the shelves because the shop was just also a maturing room. Um, and, you know, as well as having the two banks on either side of you, you also felt that it was looking in on you. So it, 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 had, a, it had a really, um, you really felt immersed in cheese. And so, um, and it was, it was a, there was always a buzz there. It was like a, there was like a glow in that shop. Um, uh, certainly for somebody who was uninitiated um, to, to cheese at that level and in a shop of that type, which was, you know, as far as I could see, unique. I'd never seen a cheese shop like that before. It didn't exist as far as I know in London at that time. Moving Premises was it was great, actually. It changed things for the better and the worse, um, mainly for the better. The, for the better, all the cheese we could mature in the basement, and that was, that was really great, and it was so much better conditions than we'd had at, um, at number nine, Neil's Yard. There were, there were nice shelves, there was room to move, room to wash, whereas before you were just so crammed in. But because you're so crammed in, you're always forced to be looking at it. Whereas when we moved into 17 Schwartz Gardens, it wasn't in front of your face so much. So it, it became a task rather than just part of what you did. Not that, you know, it wasn't perfect. It's not black and white, but it, it took it that much further away, which it's an interesting thing, but true the shop was that much bigger and that much nicer and so much easier to work in that our sales just rocketed. People came and that, that, was, that was really, it was fun. It was a really fun time to, to be there and doing that sort of thing because it was growing and it was dynamic. It was fantastic. Yeah, it, it definitely, uh, there was a, a change. It felt more like a business. Whereas Neil's Yard in, in Neil's Yard felt like an, not a business, but something that was developing and experimental. And then Short's Garden, it felt a little bit more business-like. Uh, and, you know, the counter um, and all of that aspect. But it was still, you know, it was an, another variation of Neil's Yard Dairy. Um, and it was still welcoming and friendly, but another, it felt more like a business. It had become a business rather than an experiment. They just looked like something out of time. Never seen anything like that in my life. And the British varieties are quite unique for lots of cultural and geographic reasons. And, you know, these huge cloth wrapped cheddars and Lancashire's and, and things that were visually stunning and you didn't, they presented themselves right away. You didn't need to look very deeply to, to know that it was something special and unique. And given my background, something I had never seen before in my life.
with that. Do British people just take this for granted? Is this how all English people um, eat and, and buy their cheese? Which, of course, they don't, you know, learned that this was a special shop and that people were, the people that were seeking that out were engaged in food and in cheese in a way that I didn't know was possible. So that was interesting to unravel that. And I remember being affected. I remember the prevailing feeling was one of almost an intense jealousy and drive. Like, I want to partake in this, whatever this is, I want to do that. I want to engage in that. Uh, they weren't terribly talented cheesemakers at that point. They were new to it. And frankly, there was a lot of variation in the production. So the customers had to taste the cheese because it was going to be different, right? So here, have a taste of the cheese. What do you think it's like this week? Do you like it? Hmm, I kind of do. And they got in the habit of tasting the cheese because they never knew what it'd be like. It's interesting with the, ver with the seasonal variation. You get tight acid cheeses in May. Yeah, so those tighter cheeses uh, take longer to break down and then you get more sort of meaty, bovril, meat juicy kind of flavors. Some of the late autumn cheeses Really nice milk, high fats, you get more syrupy, uh, nectary, sweet flavors. But here we were in, here we were just surrounded by, on, on two sides by council housing blocks and a really, really rough pub. And that was it, nothing to eat at all anywhere. Um, so, and there wasn't that many of us down there two or three working on cheese shift and three or four people in the sales team and that was it in this big cavernous space. So, um, uh, yeah, that was a, it, that, that seemed like a, it, you know, um, like we were moving to a big echoey chamber, um, a, a much colder space than the space we'd had before. So that was, I think someone found that difficult because what they were leaving was, you know, Borough, which was in its prime with all this incredible food everywhere. All of a sudden here we were um, in the boonies but, you know, um, uh, it, it, it very quick, you know, as the business was growing at the rate that it was growing, um, you know, we became, you know, more populous down there. We very soon needed more space again to annex the third arch. Uh, and then, you know, boosted by a, a culture which, you, because we had nothing to eat, we very soon realized that we, we needed to, we needed to, um, we needed to fend, fend for ourselves. Um, and instituted something which I think is one of the strongest parts of our culture now, um, which is the fact that we all eat lunch together, which didn't, uh, didn't happen at any time prior um, until we moved to uh, Druid Street. And they were cool people, really cool people. And they knew a lot about cheese and cheese making and cheese makers and they would visit um, and they would come up to Dalesford and, and visit us and so over the years I, I developed friendships with them and a nice feeling of kind of interdependency. You know, I've, my attitude about cheesemakers now is very different and cheese sellers is very, very different to my attitude about them then. I think I was probably a bit snobby. Oh, they make cheeses, you know. That's not, that's a, um, you know, it's not a very interesting job. Why would you want to do that? And without any kind of understanding of the history and the complexities and um, the skill of what goes into making a cheese. And it's only through the sort of, you know, nurturing and, and developing a relationship with them that you begin to understand and appreciate and just enjoy and, and enjoy the food more for that sort of understanding of where it's actually coming from. Yes, I'm sure there's some altruism and they want that cheese to exist. 
but they want that cheese to exist in that form at the top of its game because that's what makes them exist. So he doesn't come in, you know, he reads a situation, he comes in and is encouraging. So you feel encouraged. And then eventually it will, the, the dialogue will open up more to a, a one that offers you constructive feedback. So he reads you pretty well, so he knows, he learns quickly the approach that's going to work best with you. And all of those different relationships that he has, he's got as many uh, different approaches he has to, to get the best out of someone. So he can't just storm in and go, that cheese was terrible, I'm not buying it again, until you sort it. He's got to take a completely different approach. You have to have a certain kind of personality that can assimilate uh, that criticism, that failure, and you either take something negative from it or something positive. So that's a struggle, and I'm not the best at it. I guess I'm kind of a sensitive person, and hearing negative criticism is hard for me to deal with. So, but he, he, has to, he has to do that. He has to tell you when the cheese is quite right, if you haven't noticed it, or if, you know, because you're getting feedback from his, not only his customers, but his team, their cheese experts, and you're getting feedback all the time. We also hold quite a bit of sway with them, so we have to really watch our words. Yeah, you know, I, I do not ever call up on behalf of someone to go visit them because I know if I even say, you, you, well, you know, only if you want to, and da da da, they're, they're always going to say yes. Always. Because I've asked. Because we're their biggest customer, the one who tells them to put up prices. So there are things, there are bits of the relationship that you have to be very careful about and understand that while you don't feel you take advantage of anything and you don't mean to, it can very easily happen. And so that's something else we're aware of and careful about. I'm only giving a personal opinion. And so I'm not expecting them to come back to the, the, the producer that, you know, doing the cheese maker and say, hey, you know, Sandy said, yeah, this is just too salty. Um, you know, but um, sometimes maybe it does have an impact. Maybe they will say, oh, hmm, maybe we better do something about it or maybe we should look at that again or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure that my feedback has a direct um, impact on the product, but nonetheless, just the fact that you can make it, you can say what you think, is already a big thing and a novel experience. Um, and, and they're open for it. They're not defensive at all about it. And a lot of people, producers are defensive about, you know, oh, you don't like it, well, you don't have to eat it then. And so that too, Part of their ethos it drive it draws you in as a, a customer and a consumer that you feel you in some small way you are part of the process of the product and uh, that's, that's another you know I think that's part of their philosophy I don't think it's just an accident but part of the philosophy and a very powerful element to it all.